Sunday meditation service. I'm going to open with the word for today from Daily Word, and this little pamphlet has been going on since the turn of the century, and it's all over the world. When you start your day with it, you have the affirmation to start your day with and explains to you what it means. I am one with the freeing, guiding force of God. When I think of freedom, I imagine a bird in flight, soaring above the earth. I Likewise, I open my mind and heart and feel the freeing force of God within me. This force is powerful and peaceful, and I give myself over to it. As I do, I overcome stifling feelings of stress or doubt. I trust in God, and I move forward and upward with renewed purpose and confidence. I am one with the freeing, guiding force of God. This morning, I'm going to lead in the meditation to Jack's talk, actually. The meditation will be later on uh, with the singing bowls. And I'm going to read how they're formed. Each bowl begins as a molten mixture of the special seven sacred metals. It takes three to four people to hammer each bowl. One holds the hot metal with blacksmith tongs, while two or three others alternate hammering and chanting, infusing the bowl with healing intentions even as it's being created. Bowls typically range in size from three inches to 14 inches in diameter, but can also be larger or smaller. So just get yourself comfortable, and if you want to lay down on the pew, that's fine. You just want to let go of your body and just get the, the feeling of these sounds going through, in and through you. Can we bring the lights down? Okay, perfect.
Good morning, everyone. The flaw in A Course in Miracles has been discovered. It is only the third note I received uh, attempting to relate what the flaw in A Course in Miracles is. The second note stated that uh, Helen Shuckman <clears throat> used only male pronouns throughout the entire writing of A Course in Miracles. I thought this was understood by most people that the insights offered in A Course in Miracles um, are very deep. And the language is difficult quite often in explaining those particular insights. She didn't want to make it even more difficult by having to use combinations of pronouns like him, her, he, she. Uh, so she just did it using only the male pronouns. Of course, when you see me using these particular quotes, I do the best I can to remember to add the female pronoun because it is um, all about us, male and female, as one in God. Anyway, the third note that I received taped to my door revealed the flaw in A Course in Miracles. This is written by Robin Laurel, and it goes like this. <clears throat> the flaw in the Course in Miracles is the ego is not something to be vanquished, but a part of the divine. The moment we seek to conquer the ego, we set up a war within ourselves. That is my take on the flaw. Robin, are you here? Stand up if you're here. Okay. Thank you, Robin. You, I said the person that gets it first is going to receive a, an autographed copy of my book. Uh, I have a couple of books. When this session is over and we get into the group, you can let me know and I'll get you the copy. Okay, thank you for being awake in all of this. Um, My definition of the flaw in A Course in Miracles may immediately sound a little different than Robin's, but it is exactly the same as I will reveal to you in this talk. My definition of the flaw is that A Course in Miracles implies that the ego definition of self requires a body encapsulated mind which is all an embellishment of the ego illusion. I'll read that again. My definition of the flaw in The Course in Miracles implies that the ego definition of self requires a body encapsulated mind, which is all an embellishment of the ego illusion. Can we have this first PowerPoint, please? This is just one of the passages that A Course in Miracles uses uh, calling for the elimination of the ego and the body. You can read this in the Course in Miracles text, the old on page 300, in the new edition on page 323. It is impossible to divide your strength between heaven and hell, God and the ego, and release your power to creation, which is the only purpose for which it was given you. Love would always give increase. Limits are demanded by the ego and represent its demands to make little and ineffectual. Limit your sight of a brother or sister to their bodies, which you will do as long as you would not release them from it, and you have denied their gifts to you. Their bodies cannot give it and seek it not through yours. Yet your minds are already continuous and their union need only be accepted and the loveliness in heaven and the loneliness in heaven is gone. 
Okay, in this area right here, their bodies cannot give this and seek it not through your body, yet your minds are already continuous. If we understand that all minds are in communication, it doesn't negate the idea of being an individual going through this human experience. It doesn't negate that. And it doesn't negate the procedures that come out of the awareness that we are all interconnected as brothers and sisters in this world of ours. But you see, A Course in Miracles is almost uh, throughout attempting to get us to um, obliterate the ego. And this is not something that is uh, actually recognized by many of the great masters down through the ages, but certainly not recognized by the master of masters, Jesus Christ. So I hope to prove this as we go on. I do believe, however, that the flaw in A Course in Miracles, this flaw that we're talking about, that seeks us to vanquish, eliminate the ego awareness, uh, actually exists on purpose in A Course in Miracles. A Course in Miracles, of course, as Helen Shuckman, who penned it, said, was dictated by Christ. And that is true. But I want to go on to relate some of the things that will reveal to us the flaw and what is really true. I think that the, the flaw was allowed to be in A Course in Miracles because A Course in Miracles is a dynamic course in transformation. But they allow the flaw because in the end, each person must ultimately be opening himself or herself to such a degree that the intuitive part of us, which is the divine Christ nature within us, will speak to us, revealing itself. And then we will know that the true guidance comes not from reflecting upon anything in anybody's book. The true guidance comes from the deep connection we have with this intelligence and love that we recognize to be God. And it then guides our awareness and allows us to live our lives in relationship to this omnipresent intelligence and love. So the flaw is there so that we wouldn't just rely on this Course in Miracles or anybody else's written book. Ultimately, it would dawn on us that this is flawed, and I'll continue to go on to explain this. When Norma and I first entered our spiritual path, our journey, we were guided to a small, um, rather, I don't know, not quite dilapidated, but surely not upscale apartment in the lower section of Manhattan. And when we went there, this ARE center, and the ARE actually is the Association of Research and Enlightenment. It has its main center in Virginia Beach, Virginia. When Norm and I first went to this center, it was being led by a couple in their 60s, Joseph and Madeline Mead. And there may have been only, there certainly was less than 20 people attending the different classes and the different group work that we did there. At first, there was only 20, but it grew and grew while we were there. It didn't become uh, huge uh, in numbers, 
maybe 40 or 50 people were attending. But every Saturday, we would do dream interpretation, uh, group dream interpretation. And at the end of the day on Saturday, we'd do a, a, a meditation together. But we always had these group interpretations, dream interpretation. And I remember one Saturday, the leader of the center, a very spiritual gentleman, Joseph, very insightful guy, offered this dream that he had. That's one of the dreams I have never forgotten. And I will read it to you in the first person. I was walking my dog in this forest when I came to this ethereal entranceway into this beautiful meadow filled with wild flowers of every color. A man and woman dressed in white, looking like angels, stood at the entrance. I thought, is this heaven? Am I dead? The angels at the entrance motioned me to, the en to enter. I walked to the entrance and they stopped me, saying, your dog is not permitted to enter. You must leave him behind. I was kind of stunned in the dream, but I said, the dogs are not allowed in heaven? The people at the gate just nodded yes. And I said, then this can't be heaven. And I walked away. And so should you and anybody who actually reaches the state of enlightenment that Joseph Mead had attained. So this is a true story that reveals the underlying, undeniable truth of the master of masters. If heaven is in our midst, which is the way the master stated it in the book of Luke, chapter 17, verses 21. That's it. If heaven is in our midst, uh, as the master stated it, and all around us, as he stated it in the Gospel of Thomas, then it can't be just ethereal, spiritual, and not also physical and quite human. This being the truth that eventually dawns in the mind of every devoted truth student also requires the teachings of A Course in Miracles to be measured by it. I'm going to read that again. If heaven is in our midst, within us and all around us, which is where the master stated it is, in the Gospel of Luke and in the Gospel of Thomas, it is stated as such. Then it can't be just ethereal, spiritual, and not also physical and quite human. This being the truth that eventually dawns in the mind of every devoted truth student also requires the te teachings in A Course in Miracles to be measured by it. Can we have this next PowerPoint, please? This is from Edgar Casey. And by the way, when I quote Edgar Casey, you must know how I think of Edgar Casey. Edgar Casey is perhaps the most extraordinary human being after Jesus that walked the earth. Okay? And for those of you that might be new, and don't know anything about Edgar Casey. He is the most documented clairvoyant that we have ever had. He gave 16,000 readings that will heal you, blow your mind, open you up, and reveal to you the teachings of the master of light. That's what his 
readings do. He passed on in 1947. This is from his book, The Edgar Cayce Companion, and this is what he states. Happiness is a state of mind attained by giving same to others. Happiness is love of something outside of self. It may never be obtained, may never be known by loving only things within self. Few are willing to pay the price for happiness, which is tolerance, patience, and selflessness in the expressions to its associates, its fellow people, its activities in the earth. I will read that again. Okay? Can you take it back, please? Happiness is a state of mind attained by giving same to others. Happiness is love of something outside of self. It may never be obtained, may never be known by loving only things within self. Few are willing to pay the price for happiness, which is tolerance, patience, and selflessness in the expressions to one's associates, its fellow people, its activities in the earth. <clears throat> Thus, the ego, which defines each human individually, may be considered to be an illusion by A Course in Miracles, but only because it doesn't acknowledge that everything we look upon exists by divine decree of the one creator. There is no place, no person, no condition, no situation under heaven, under the sun, that is not God expressing. So the object of our spiritual quest is not to obliterate the ego, which is also part of the divine creation, but awaken it to its calling to be the servant in the material plane, to be the servant to the will of love. So the ego defining each as an individual still should be awakened to the idea and the ideal that we are all brothers and sisters of the one intelligence, the one love, the one presence, the one power in all the universe, which we acknowledge to be God, which Jesus acknowledged to be God. In conclusion, there is no heaven, no place to give and receive love without our many different neighbors. I'll read that again. Remember, you'll remember, I'm sure most of you know it and are remembering it right now. And I'll show it to you in a second. In conclusion, there is no heaven, no place to give and receive love without our many neighbors. And A Course in Miracles is flawed, advocating a non-human state of consciousness as the ideal because it doesn't include neighbors like us or dogs, cats, birds, children, friendships, music, dancing, singing, laughing, crying, and love. I will read that again. In conclusion, there is no heaven, no place where we could give and receive love without our many different neighbors. And the cause in miracles it flawed advocating a non-human state of consciousness as the ideal because it doesn't include neighbors like us or dogs, cats, birds, children, friendships, music, dancing, singing, 
laughing, crying, and love. When I first started the ministry in Boulder, I used to have fundamental Christians occasionally show up here and uh, wear signs and sometimes they would come in and say that we're at odds with God or you need to understand and accept Jesus as your personal savior if you expect to go to heaven. Uh, when they used to show up and they'd say, we're praying for you, I would say, fine, you just pray. Don't, don't make a lot of disturbance. I've got a lot of work to do. And uh, they sometimes would stand outside my office and, and pray. One day I offered a, a Presbyterian prayer warrior this idea. I said, you know, I'll tell you what. You can go to your congregation and ask for your greatest artist, your greatest writer, have them come forth and collaborate and give me the vision that they have of heaven. And I will share my vision with you of this amazingly beautiful earth with its mountains and its oceans and its rivers and sea creatures that are so different from one another, you can't even begin to explain them. And creatures on the planet, so beautiful, so interesting, unbelievable. And forests so glorious, and canyons so deep. And stars that shine on us. And the sun that gives us life and growth. I'll tell you what, give me your vision of some pearly gates and some amethyst streets and golden buildings, maybe, and I'm bored stiff. They didn't come back after that. They never showed me their vision of heaven. Because the master of life said it's in our midst. The problem we have is we are asleep in our relationship to this divine intelligence we call God. I'm going to continue the series, by the way. You're going to receive a number of things that I have to say over the way, revealing these points of view. So this series on the floor in the Course in Miracles is going to consider uh, continue every Sunday. Can we have this uh, video, please? This is the master of life's ideal, shared so this way. Jesus means. 
okay? I want you to all stretch a little bit. You know that I further interpret that one scripture about God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son into it, that whosoever believeth on him is not to believe on Jesus. The only begotten son is that intelligence and love that resides within us, the Christ in each of us. And when we recognize that that Christ actually exists, although it may be dormant in many, in every single being on earth, then we are called to look past quite often and forgive the limitations of other people and to love them or accept them in that way. And that's the will of God being revealed in what we do. So uh, I'm going to, uh, let's have this final PowerPoint. This is A Course in Miracles. It's not, it's right on with this. You can read this on Course in Miracles text, page 92. The new edition is on, it's on page 100. You are only love. But when you deny this, you make what you are something you must learn to remember. Teach only love, for that is what you are. This is the one lesson that is perfectly unified because it is the only lesson that is one. Only by teaching it can you learn it. As you teach, so will you learn. If that is true, and it is true indeed, do not forget that what you teach is teaching you. If you're familiar with the Course in Miracles, we'll take this back again. I'll read it again. You are only love. That means it's an absolute. Created in the image and likeness of God, we are, in fact, only love. But when you deny this, you make what you are something you must learn to remember. Teach only love, for that is what you are. This is the only lesson that is perfectly unified because it is the only lesson that is one. And that means the only lesson that reveals we are all one, brothers and sisters, part of the presence of God in every condition, circumstance, in every place, at all times. This is the one lesson that is perfectly unified because it is the only lesson that is one. Only by teaching it can you learn it. As you teach, so will you learn. If that is true, and it is true indeed, do not forget that what you teach is teaching you. That's our calling. By faith, we start to look past the seeming limitations, the foibles of other people. And we hold them in a place of acceptance and compassion. And we, we give as we can, in whatever way we can, through our lives. And as we do that, in other words, we're simply serving love without looking for any return but then we recognize the return on love because these people that appear to be separate from us ultimately start to return their love to us, their consideration, their friendship to us. Do you see how honorable the universe is? And do you see how difficult it is to take to task our minds which have been so badly conditioned to believe in a definition of life that is so separate, so antagonistic, so fearful. But we must take to task our own individual awareness and start to live beyond it. And if we start to do that, we begin to see how we heal, not only ourselves, but others. And so it's saying, as you teach, it's teaching you. And that is what we will learn. 
by taking our own awareness to task. Now I'm going to ask you to do something a little different for the meditation because this particular chant, a number of these chants that we have done, most of them Norma has written, but this one she has not written, but she has done this one a number of times. I think this chant is so befitting us and this service. I would ask you to feel comfortable in joining me. We're going to chant this, and we're going to chant it for a long time, maybe two or three minutes. Just get in touch with this. Oh, my Lord, guide me to
guide me to love. Oh, love my life, oh, my life. Oh, my We will take an offering for unity now. <clears throat> and those of you that are watching live stream, you have these different ways that you can tithe, but you can also scroll down as a place in our website where you can scroll down to a place that says donate. You can hit that and it'll give you a way to donate to Unity of Boulder. As we take our offerings in our hands, let's bless them with this offering prayer. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive because I give. We'll do that again together. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive because I give. Love of you. 
Join me now, please. We dedicate this tithe to the will and the work of the Spirit of Truth and to the victory of the Spirit of Truth. Amen. <laughs> As usual, we will have a discussion group for anyone that would like to stay and talk. We have refreshments in Fellowship Hall. And so you can pick up some refreshments, come and sit down with us in the group if you have some questions about today's talk or any questions about unity. Um, come and sit down with us and we have a discussion. And Santisha will be uh, officiating at the 11 o'clock service. If you're new today, the 11 o'clock service is completely different, very contemporary very insightful and spiritual. So you may want to just have some refreshments, hang out, and then come to the 11 o'clock service. To everyone. Wednesday night? Well, Wednesday night, you're right. Who said that? There's somebody Steve who's... Hayes. Oh, that was Steve Hayes. How dare you interrupt me, Steve? <laughs> All right, yes, Wednesday night is being changed from 7 o'clock to six o'clock. The, the Wednesday night meditation will be at six o'clock. That gives us a chance after the meditation to go out and get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, six o'clock on Wednesday. Everybody have a beautiful day. <laughs>